Welcome, uh, everyone. I'm Michael Moreland. I teach at the law school at Villanova University outside of Philadelphia, and I am the chair of the Religious Liberties Practice Group of the Federal Society, which is uh, sponsoring today's event. Uh, I want to thank especially the people from the Federal Society's office who helped put this event together, especially Nathan Kazmarek and Kayla Kleist. And now I will turn it over to our moderator for today, Jenny Bradley Lichter, the Deputy General Counsel of the Catholic University of America. Thank you, Mike. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming here for an in-person luncheon panel event of the sort that seemed for a while to be going the way of the dinosaur. Um, I love webinars, I love Fed Talk webinars, but there's really nothing like being together for a meal and a good conversation um, about an interesting and timely topic. So Amen. I'm a <laughs> um, So it's good to be together today. I am going to do brief introductions because I know we're all much more interested in hearing from these folks than from me, but I do want to just orient you to our panel. Our first speaker down at the opposite end um, is going to be the Honorable Paul Clement. He is currently a partner at Clement & Murphy PLLC, the firm he launched some months ago, and has a well-documented history, I would say, elsewhere in private practice. <laughs> His years of government service culminated in his service as the 43rd Solicitor General of the United States from 2005 until 2008. I was lucky enough to be a 1L intern in that office when Paul was the Solicitor General, and that was certainly one of the highlights of my legal formation. Paul has argued over 100 cases before the United States Supreme Court, including several high-profile religious freedom cases. Before he was arguing in the Supreme Court, he clerked there for Justice Scalia and also clerked for Judge Lawrence Silberman on the DC Circuit. Next, we're going to hear from Professor Bill Galston, who holds the Ezra K. Zilka Chair at the Brookings Institution in the Governance Studies Program. He previously served as, among other things, Professor and Acting Dean at the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. He's been a participant in six presidential campaigns, which is pretty amazing, and served during the Clinton administration as the deputy assistant to the president for domestic policy. That's a role that we have in common. I held that role uh, a few years ago. I think that one of Bill's successors in that role was Justice Kagan, if I recall correctly. Maybe That's the most true. famous holder of the, the domestic policy deputy position in the White House. Bill is the author of nine books and hundreds of articles about political theory, public policy, American politics, and pluralism, as well as a weekly column for the Wall Street Journal. Professor Mark Rienzi is president of the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty, my colleague at Catholic University, where he teaches in the law school and leads the Center for Religious Liberty, and a visiting professor at Harvard Law School. In addition to all of his administrative and academic roles, he continues to represent clients in religious exercise and free speech cases often successfully, from what I can tell, and including at the Supreme Court. Earlier in his career, Mark spent some time in private practice and clerked for Judge Stephen Williams on the DC Circuit. Finally, uh, right here next to me, Rachel Lazar is the president and CEO at Americans United for Separation of Church and State. Before joining AU, Rachel served as deputy director of the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism directed the culture program at Third Way, a progressive think tank dedicated to reaching moderates, and was senior counsel at the National Women's Law Center. For years, Rachel has been a frequent speaker, author, and advocate on a number of issues, including racial justice, LGBTQ rights, abortion access, and the separation of church and state. Um, believe it or not, these intros have only scratched the surface of each of our panelists' experience. You can find much more at the Federalist Society website. We are really lucky to have these four folks with us who are all terrific advocates and experts and all have a lot to say about free exercise, RIFRA and how it's aged in the last 30 years, the relationship between church and state and much else. So we're going to do um, opening statements, if you will, from every panelist, then we'll um, talk amongst ourselves for a while and we do intend to leave quite a bit of time for audience question and answer. So be thinking of your questions um, as the conversation proceeds. So we're going to start with Paul Clement. Thanks, Paul. So thank you. It's great to be here. Um, it's great to be celebrating what I certainly view as a happy occasion, uh, the, the, the birthday, more or less, uh, of RIFRA. Um, I'm going to just sort of set the stage for this. 
um, discussion, I hope, um, but I'm going to do it from a distinct perspective, which is, um, and, I, and I think Professor Galston will be able to sort of fill this out a little bit by, with a slightly different perspective, but I'm going to sort of tell the story of RIFRA largely through the eyes of a Scalia clerk. Um, and so for me, um, this all starts with Smith, uh, Employment Division Against Smith. And of course, Employment Division Against Smith is the Scalia opinion that conservatives love to hate. Um, but you know, I, I think it's really worth sort of understanding um, a couple of things about the decision that set the stage for RIFRA. Um, first of all is, you know, before you blame just Justice Scalia for this decision, it really was a 5-4 decision of the court where most of the court's conservatives were with Justice Scalia in the majority, um, and the dissent was Justice O'Connor and uh, Justices Brennan, Justices Marsh Justice Marshall, and Justice Blackman. That's not the company that Justice O'Connor most often found herself in. Um, and, you know, obviously Justice Kennedy and Chief Justice Rehnquist were with Justice Scalia in the majority. So one takeaway is don't blame just Justice Scalia if you don't like Smith. Uh, you really have to blame the whole right side of the court. And, and of course, the, the fact that it was more the right side of the court, it was more nuanced than that. Justice Stevens, Justice White were also uh, in the majority. Uh, but the fact that it was more the right side of the court than the left side of the court that was responsible for Smith, I think it's just an important context as you, as you, as you lead up to RIFRA. Uh, a second thing that I would kind of mention um, is, you know, the, the court obviously very, in coming up with its sort of test for rules, neutral rules of general applicability, distinguishes Sherbert and Yoder. Um, Justice Scalia distinguishes Yoder uh, as a hybrid case on grounds that I, I think must have like felt to Justice Scalia like the weakest part of his whole case because he distinguished Yoder on the grounds that it was a hybrid constitutional right with the other right being the Pierce against society of Smith uh, right to rear your children, which in any other context, Justice Scalia would recognize as a substantive due process provision that he wanted nothing to do with. So I think his distinction of Yoder was at least interesting. Um, the majority also definitively rep rejects any centrality test as unadministrable by uh, judges. And so one potential way of trying to limit the scope of a free exercise right, i.e. it only applies to uh, religious beliefs that are central to the religion, is, is discarded by the majority as being completely unworkable. And, and that leads, I think, then to a starker contrast between what the majority proposes as the, as, as the default sort of principally rational basis test and the compelling interest, least restrictive alternative, more or less strict scrutiny test that's set up by the dissenters. It's kind of the court, almost on both ends, rejects the middle ground. Now here's the thing I, I, I do want to focus on at a, a, a little more length, and that is to just understand where Justice Scalia is coming from. I mean, this is not a justice, look at the rest of his judicial career, who doesn't like religious claimants. And in a way, I think for Justice Scalia, in the end, the Smith decision was less a religious liberty decision and more a decision about the roles of judges in our system. And you really see this in footnote five of the Smith decision, because this is where uh, Justice Scalia kind of responds to Justice O'Connor when they confront the so-called parade of horribles. So just to set the stage for this, Justice Scalia in the Smith decision is essentially explaining why he doesn't uh, want to adopt a compelling interest, least restrictive alternative test. And he, he, he says that essentially it would raise all sorts of problems for uh, policies where there is, hasn't been a religious exemption and a religious exemption would be problematic. So here's his quick parade of horribles. The, I'm quoting here, but I'm simplifying, cleaned up as they like to say. Uh, the rule respondents favor would open the prospect of constitutionally required religious exemptions from civic obligations of almost every conceivable kind, raising, ranging from compulsory military service to the payment of taxes, to compulsory vaccination laws, drug laws, to social welf welfare such as the minimum wage, child labor, animal cruelty, environmental protection, and laws providing for the equal opportunity for the races. So that is his parade of horribles. 
Justice O'Connor responds to that by saying, don't worry, courts have been and know how to handle those kind of cases. And his rejoinder to Justice O'Connor in footnote five goes as follows. Quote, Justice O'Connor contends that the parade of horribles in the text only demonstrates that the, court have been, the courts have been quite capable of striking sensible balances between religious liberty and competing state interests. But the cases we, have, we, the cases we cite struck sensible balances only because they've all applied the general laws despite claims for religious exemptions. In any event, Justice O'Connor mistakes the purpose of our parade. It is not to suggest that the courts would necessarily permit harmful exemptions from these laws, though they might, but to suggest that courts would constantly be in the business of determining whether the severe impact of various laws on religious practice, and let me just, suffices to permit us to confer an exemption. It is a parade of horribles because it is horrible to contemplate that federal judges will regularly balance against the importance of general laws the significance of religious practice. And I think that last line really is the, the heart of Justice Scalia's reasoning for not adopting compelling interest and least restrictive alternative test. So that sets the stage for RIFRA three years later in 1993. And I think whatever you think about the debate between Justice Scalia and Justice O'Connor in Smith, you have to say that RIFRA adopted Justice O'Connor's side of the debate completely. And so the court, the, the, the Congress in enacting this adopts the compelling interest test and then in its purpose section specifically says that it's applying, uh, that it wants to sort of invoke the, the, the test uh, from Sherbert and Yoder. So it definitively rejects Justice Scalia's position in favor of Justice O'Connor's position. Obviously in Bernie, a few years later, the court essentially limits the application of RIFRA to the federal government. Um, and in th that decision, there's a little bit of a reprise of Smith where Justice O'Connor really in dissent doesn't say that, uh, in, in her opinion, doesn't really say anything different than the majority about the scope of Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, but just basically says it's wrong to use Smith as a yardstick. I still think the majority got that wrong. I'm still mad about it, and here's my, here's my argument, and then Scalia can't resist the temptation to respond to that. So, so here's, let me just sort of supplement that sort of background with my own experience in arguing a couple of cases uh, under RIFRA. Um, I had the you know, immense privilege of representing both Hobby Lobby um, and the Little Sisters of the Poor in RIFRA litigation along with, uh, with Mark's wonderful organization, the Beckett Fund. And in those cases, what really struck me is that when it came to a case where people were getting ready to apply RIFRA in context, two things that were very interesting happened. First, despite some predictions to the contrary, Justice Scalia had no problem applying this compelling interest least restrictive alternative test that he railed against in Smith. Now, some people suggested there was a hint of hypocrisy in that, but in my view, that just misunderstands the separation of powers. I mean, Justice Scalia almost reveled with the fact that, all right, it's a stupid and unadministrable test, but now you've given it to me, I'm gonna apply it, and it's gonna mean that in most of these cases, the religious adherent's gonna win. So he had, in my view, no hypocrisy there, just like I, I, I sort of told you so, but now you've made me do it, so I'm gonna do it. But the second thing I found so interesting, it was that when I was arguing, essentially invoking RIFRA, trying to protect the RIFRA rights of my clients, I got the exact same parade of horribles from Justice O'Connor's dissent and Justice Scalia's Smith opinion. Like, it's as if nothing changed. All of the test, all of the arguments, many of the questions I got, and some of the back and forth in the Hobby Lobby opinion are these same things, compulsory service, uh, vaccinations, taxes, minimum wage laws, anti-discrimination provisions. And so it's, in, in a sense, the, the basic debate here hasn't really sort of changed that much. And then I'll just finish with this, which is kind of my takeaway from all of that. So I think, you know, RIFRA continues to be somewhat controversial and increasingly so, in part because both Justice Scalia and Justice O'Connor sort of had a point in the sense that, you know, this compelling interest, least restrictive alternative test is a very protective test. And if you apply the test faithfully, 
uh, religious adherents are going to do very well, even in some context where sensible judges doing some balancing might have come out differently. And if you look around the federal judiciary these days, uh, there are more people that look at things like Justice Scalia than people who look at things like Justice O'Connor. I mean, the, the sort of balancing everything's an undue burden test is not really in vogue with most federal judges. So what you get with RIFRA in application today is very protective in practice of religious exercise, maybe even more protective of religious exercise in practice than Justice O'Connor uh, really was intending it to be as long as she was the one doing the balancing. Fascinating, thank you. All right, Bill, over to you. <clears throat> well, ha, I was gonna lead off with footnote five, but <laughs> I think that's no longer necessary. You've gotten a very, very comprehensive exegesis of footnote five. Uh, I wanna read just to get things started uh, from another portion of Justice Scalia's opinion. Uh, he says, editing a little bit, moreover, if compelling interest really means what it says, uh, and watering it down here would subvert its rigor in the other fields where it's applied, many laws would not meet the test. Any society adopting such a system would be courting anarchy. Uh, I would submit that that is Hobbesian hogwash. Uh, you know, and you know, judges making particularist judgments based on the relative weight of clashing interests, including a constitutional right to religious liberty, that's, it may horrify Justice Scalia. I fail to see what's so horrible about it, right? I mean, you're talking about very fundamental clashes in a society. And you can't pretend, you can't give one of the, one of the competing principles a weight of 100 and the other zero. That's not true to the nature of the debate. So what alternative is there but to balance them either in an unconstrained way or in a more rule-governed way? Uh, I'm entirely on Justice O'Connor's side in this debate, and I do not think that history has borne out the proposition that applying RIFRA courts anarchy. Uh, but let me talk a little bit more personally about RIFRA. You know, I, I walked into the White House for the first time in my life, uh, uh, January 21st of 1993, to become Deputy Assistant for domestic policy, and one of my first assignments was RIFRA. It turned out not to be a heavy lift, and the history here is instructive. I think it's fair to say that you know, Justice Scalia's decision evoked a storm of outrage across the political and religious spectrum. And when President Clinton came to sign the bill on November 16th of 1993, I was there for the signing ceremony, it was an extraordinary assemblage of American religion. In addition to the politicians who had backed the law, uh, there were people in the vestments of, I think, every faith in the country. Not only that, there were representatives of 68 groups from you know, the National Association of Evangelicals to you know, People for the American Way. You know, uh, you know, Bill Clinton and Al Gore, both of whom spoke, both came up with you know, amusing pairings of groups that had come together to support RIFRA and who were present on the occasion. The Senate of the United States approved RIFRA by a vote of 97 to 3. Even in pre-polarization days, you didn't get 93 senators you know, in favor of anything except, main, in step, 
except maybe renaming a post office. It passed the House of Representatives unanimously. RIFRA represented the voice of the American people speaking back to the Supreme Court. It was a genuinely constitutional dialogue between the court and the legislature, between the court and the people. And the American people, from left to right, from fervent believer to most atheists, said, court, you got it wrong. So wrong that we're not going to stand for it. I think that is, a, that is a fair account of the politics of the situation. Uh, also of interest was the speech. I mean, President Clinton did not commit him, uh, contend himself with a written signing statement. He gave a speech. And in that speech, he went well beyond the letter of RIFRA. And let me just call this brief passage to attend. You know, he referred to a climate in this country, and I quote, in which some people are embarrassed to say that they advocate a course of action simply because they, they believe it is the right thing to do, because they believe it is dictated by their faith, by what they discern to be with their best efforts, the will of God. I submit to you today, my fellow Americans, that we can stand that kind of debate in this country. He went on to say, it is high time that we had an open and honest reaffirmation of the role of American citizens of faith, not so that we can agree, but so that we can argue and discourse and seek out the truth and seek to heal this troubled land. Let us never believe that freedom of religion imposes on any of us the responsibility to run from our convictions, close quote. You know, that was what a center-left Democratic president thought about the role of religion uh, in uh, 1993. A lot of water has gone under the bridge since then. Uh, how much more time do I have? I would say about three to five minutes, if you'd like it. OK. Uh, then I'm going, to, I'm going to segue from a bit of history you know, in which I, you know, I played a very minor role, you know, but I am still pleased 30 years later to have been on what I regarded the right, as the right side. I have not changed my mind about RIFRA even though it has been used, as Mr. Clement said, in ways in practice that don't always make me happy. Uh, but let me, let me return to what I talked about at the beginning of my remarks. That is, the unavoidability of dealing with a clash between things of, of, of importance. You know, a clash that has to be addressed somehow. And let me, just put, let me just put a few hypotheticals on the table. There is a neo-Aztec revival. And, you know, an Aztec, an Aztec priest appears before some court to argue the following. It is our sincere belief that if we do not sacrifice seven virgins at the, virgins rather, at the winter solstice, uh, that the world will spin off its axis and be destroyed. Now, it strikes me as very clear that no court in the land would sustain that claim. Why not? Because there are certain interests that are so compelling that any government, and certainly this government, obviously if Moctezuma came back, uh, that would be a different matter, but certainly any government, anything like ours, would say, no, you may sincerely believe that, but you can't do it. Okay? That wasn't so hard, was it? Now for a hypothetical that I've always wanted, always wanted to put before Justice Scalia, but never had the chance to goes as follows. Go back to 1919 and 1920 to the Volstead Act. 
The Volstead Act carved out an exemption for sacramental wine. Suppose it hadn't. Uh, speaking as a Jew who has been educated on halakhic matters by his very orthodox son, I checked just last night. Drinking wine at a Passover Seder is not optional. I asked him, what about grape juice? He said, nope. Doesn't satisfy the, you know, the standard interpretation of the laws of celebrating Passover. I then checked with the Catholic Church. And it turns out that, you know, that, that the, I would say, the central position on the Catholic Church, I, I know there are Catholics on this dais and in the audience who can correct me if I'm wrong, you know, it sacram it's not sacramental grape juice, it's sacramental red wine for reasons that go back, you know, to the famous Seder that launched Catholic communion. Now, would Justice Scalia really have applied the Smith holding in these circumstances? Would he have thought it reasonable to do so? I find that hard to believe. It seems to me that it it, it seems to me that in these circumstances uh, that a sensible court would recognize the importance of the religious exercise claim by allowing exemptions for religious groups that can show it has nothing to do with centrality. It has to do with the mandatory quality of the requirement. Can anybody imagine you know, that the harm done to society by ritual exemptions from the Volstead Act would have equaled the harm done to free exercise by prohibiting Jews and Catholics from celebrating the, some of the core rituals of their faith? I don't believe it. But, and I don't think it would be sensible to rule otherwise. Uh, but uh, I think I should, I sh should yield the floor. Mm -hmm. I've made my point. Can, can I just say, I'm pretty sure Justice Scalia would say that as long as you wait till the right point in the service, it's the blood of Christ and the Volstead <laughs> Act doesn't apply. <laughs> All right. That is one fantastic loophole. Um, spoken by a great advocate over there. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Okay. Mark Rianzi, go ahead. Great. And Bill, just like uh, Paul stole a little of your thunder with, uh, with footnote five, you stole a little bit of mine with the Aztecs. I was going to use the Aztecs as an example. Um, <laughs> Look, let me start with, uh, with a high-level point, which is that RIFRA is clearly right and Smith is clearly wrong. Um, if you're going to protect the free exercise of diverse religions, right, you're going to let people practice different faiths, um, then you're going to have to protect different things for different people. And the Smith decision acted like that was a problem. They called it a constitutionally an constitutional anomaly. It doesn't quite work. Um, the answer is, of course it works. It's about allowing people to practice different religions. And so what that means is that the Volstead Act would hit Catholics and Jews different than it would hit somebody else, right? So for the Catholics and Jews, drinking wine in those particular circumstances is the exercise of religion, such that if you forbade it, you would, of course, be prohibiting their free exercise of religion. Um, and therefore, under just the free exercise clause properly interpreted, of course, they have a right to do that. Um, Smith restores that way of thinking about religion and religious exercise in what I think is a good way. You um, meant RIFRA, didn't you? I'm sorry, RIFRA restores <laughs> it. Someday post Smith will restore it elsewhere. Um, let me start uh, with something that was part of the Scalia versus O'Connor fight and is actually part of the text of RIFRA, at least the findings before it, which is the idea that Congress said that RIFRA helps us strike sensible balances, right? And I think it's clear when you read the Smith decision that Justice Scalia, and the other justices in that majority, um, they were worried about it. They didn't think it would lead to sensible balances. Um, they thought it would lead to anarchy and constitutional anomaly. Uh, but the test really does lead to sensible balances, and to the extent 
Justice Scalia in 1990 didn't have a crystal ball to tell him the answer to that question. Um, we have a rear view mirror in 2024 um, that tells us that it does lead to sensible balances and it works out fine and it's not anarchy. Um, and here's where I was going to use the Aztec example, uh, but religion doesn't always win under RIFRA. Um, if your religious exercise is to sacrifice children in an Aztec ceremony or sacrifice children to Moloch, um, or if I say my religious exercise is driving the wrong way on the beltway when I get out of here, um, I'm going to lose, and I should lose. And the reason I lose is that, of course, the government has a compelling government interest in stopping me from killing other people. Um, and of course, the only way, the least restrictive way, and the only way to stop me from killing people is to stop me from killing people. But most of the time, that's not what we're talking about, and that's not the kind of case that, that comes up under RIFRA. And most of the time, the government has many, many other ways to pursue its legitimate interests, whatever they are, without forcing someone to violate his or her religion. And so what we've seen in the decades of RIFRA, so we've had three decades of federal RIFRA, in a lot of states we've had 20, between 20 and 25 years of state level RIFRAs. Some of them are more recent, but a lot of them come from the late 90s, early 2000s now. Um, and what we've seen is it's absolutely not anarchy, right? It leads to religious exemptions. It doesn't tear down the entire law. So Paul spoke about Hobby Lobby and the Little Sisters of the Poor. And we won those cases, and there are versions of them that keep going, and, and we keep winning them. Uh, but, but guess what hasn't been torn down? The contraceptive mandate, right? All Hobby Lobby won was a religious exemption, right? They didn't tear down the whole law. It didn't lead to anarchy. Um, and it turns out there's lots of ways to get contraception to people without forcing you know, Catholic nuns and others to be part of it, right? It turns out that it's really easy and contraception is really widely available and the government provides it through all sorts of different federal programs and there are all sorts of different state programs that do it too. What RIFRA does is RIFRA forces the government to double check and to say, do I really need to force that religious person to violate his or her religion? Um, or is there another way to achieve the goal? And um, at the risk of praising the administrative state at a FedSoc gathering, which I, I do hesitantly, um, here's one virtue of our gigantic administrative state. Um, the government has a ton of tools in the toolkit. And if the question is, hey, United States government, can you come up with a way to distribute contraception to people? Um, what tools do you have in the toolkit? The answer is they have a gigantic alphabet soup of agencies. They've got lots of statutes. They have more employees or agencies than any of us can count or even find. Um, they can get it done if they want to get it done. And what that means is that almost all the time, the right answer really is, if that's really a burden on someone's religion, you ought to work around it. Um, it's not every time, right? Uh, the tax case is lost. Um, they lost under the uh, free exercise clause, but they lose under RIFRA too. The government's allowed to run a tax system, and just because each of us might object to something our taxes someday go to, they couldn't run the system. The court said that in Lee, and that, that sounds right to me. Um, but the important point to think about the history of what we've learned since RIFRA and what Justice Scalia and the rest of the majority just didn't have in front of them in 1990, but we know now, uh, is that it just hasn't been anarchy. Um, it hasn't been anarchy at the federal level. Like, honestly, before Hobby Lobby, 99% of America never heard of RIFRA. Um, it wasn't leading to anarchy. It was fine. Um, a patchwork of states, this is my favorite part of it, a patchwork of states, not all the states, a patchwork of states have state RIFRAs. It's like 25-ish, and another 10 or so have it in their state constitutions. But guess what no one's ever said when they cross the border from Maryland to Virginia? Oh, I'm going into the anarchy state, right? Like, Nobody does that because it's not anarchy, right? It's just not. It works out fine. It leads to limited exceptions for small groups of people who have minority beliefs, right? You don't need a RIFRA right if you think the same thing as the majority because the majority then won't force you to do something that violates your religion. You need a RIFRA right when you think something different from the governing majority and you need room to be able to live out your faith. And so that's happened in practice. It's happened coast to coast across the country and it's fine. Um, RIFRA, in some ways, I think has saved Smith for a while, um, in that for a long time, I don't think the Supreme Court really had to confront the difficulty of the Smith test, because the federal RIFRA and the state RIFRAs and all these other off-ramps essentially gave other courts ways to decide things short of the free exercise clause. The Supreme Court didn't really have a lot of, let me figure out what counts as neutral and generally applicable cases in the years from 
say, Smith to Fulton, right? So had Lakumi, it was a, you know, Lakumi was a, a clear outlier of a really, really bad case. Um, and then they didn't really have much else. And they didn't really have much else, I think, because RIFRA and, and state constitutions and state laws essentially got most of the religious liberty cases resolved, so the court didn't have to bear the burden of applying RIFRA in a case like, like Bill said, like the Volstead Act or something like it. Justice Scalia never had to confront it because the RIFRAs, I think, saved the court from having to hear those cases. Um, I think something different changed when COVID came along, right? When COVID came along, the Supreme Court, often on the emergency docket, or depending on who wins, the shadow docket, it's, it's scary when the wrong side wins. It's, it's normal when others win. Uh, but on, on the emergency docket, or the shadow docket, um, when COVID hit, the court had this series of cases, like almost every week or two weeks, that would come up because the mayor or governor or whoever was the autocrat who was running your life during COVID, you know, would issue the newest order. Um, and then it would say, well, everything's got to stay closed, including the churches, but, you know, maybe not blackjack, right? Um, and so these cases would keep coming up to the court where they would have to consider, well, how really do I apply this neutral and generally applicable thing? Um, and I think it's actually been good the past few years between the COVID cases and Fulton um, and Masterpiece and 303 too, well, 303 they did on speech grounds, but I think it's good that the court has had to exercise that muscle of answering some of those questions about what does Smith mean. I think it's eventually gonna lead to Smith's extinction. I think the court actually knows that Smith is not the right interpretation of the free exercise clause and we'll get to something. Uh, something better at some point. But I think in many ways, RIFRA protected it for a long time, but also reveals that the underlying thinking of Smith just wasn't true. It's not anarchy, it's not a big deal. Let me on the, end on a positive note. The RIFRA clash that by far has been in the news the most, I think, over the past 10 years is the contraceptive mandate fight with Hobby Lobby and the Little Sisters of the Poor. And our argument from day one was, gosh, you guys could probably do this without the nuns. Um, well, you know, here's my happy report. The Biden administration's current proposed rulemaking, if they stick with it, their current proposed rulemaking actually says, you know what, we can do it without the nuns. We've got other ways to do it. And so it took a really long time. It dragged the country through a lot of unnecessary culture war. But in the end, I think the place we're going to get to is both the Trump administration and the Biden administration saying, yeah, we could have a religious exemption to that, because guess what? We provide health care in a lot of places. That's good. Thank you. All right, to round out the first phase of this conversation, Rachel Lazar. Thanks. So I want to start by honoring religious freedom. What an incredible gift it was when our founders got together and decided that this country, unlike any other, would promise every single one of us the right to join whatever religion we want and to practice it how we want. What a gift. As an American Jew, and on a personal note, I'm particularly grateful for this promise from America. It enabled my own relatives to flee actually religious persecution in Eastern Europe and to come here. And religious freedom is largely, not entirely, what's enabled my family to continue to thrive in this country. My gratitude for religious freedom combined with my own commitment to a continued inclusive America is what drives me to do the work I do as the head of Americans United for Separation of Church and State. So in the remainder of my brief remarks, I'm going to do three things. I'm going to tell you some stories about how RIFRA is undermining religious freedom. Then I'll describe what RIFRA was intended to do and play off of what some of the other folks said. And I'll conclude by exploring the essence of what the disagreement over RIFRA seems to be about. So first, let me tell you about Amy Madonna. She's an AU client. She lives in Simpsonville, South Carolina, a mother of three, a married woman. She grew up with a lot of foster siblings. Her dad had been a foster kid. Now she wants to bring foster kids into her own home and family. The taxpayer-funded foster care agency she went to put her through a rigorous application process, as they should, and they told her after it that she would be the perfect person. They just had one more question for her. What was the name of her church? Our Lady of the Rosary, she told them. That was her Catholic parish. The government-funded foster care agency, Miracle Hill, 
refused to work with Amy. They rejected this perfect foster mom. Why? Because she's Catholic and not evangelical Protestant. The Trump administration waded into the fight and they invoked RIFRA to exempt Miracle Hill from federal anti-discrimination laws. The administration used RIFRA to ensure that Miracle Hill, the foster agency, could both take taxpayer dollars and turn away people who are the, quote, wrong religion. The shield of religious freedom was turned into a sword. A sword used against Amy Madonna and thousands of foster children in South Carolina in need of loving homes. Amy Madonna's case isn't an isolated one. I'll tell you two other quick stories. Another set of clients of Americans United are Liz and Gabe Rutten Ram. They're this incredibly caring Jewish couple. They live in Knoxville, Tennessee, and they can't have biological children. So they decide, actually set their hearts on a little boy with special needs who they want to foster to, to adopt. And they go to their local foster care agency and they're turned away because they're Jewish. Because this foster agency, Holston United Methodist, only works with Christians who are willing to sign their particular statement of faith. And one final story, oh and I'll just say before I forget, that in the Liz and Gabe Rutenram case, RIFRA was invoked in the legal case, but it was invoked against Liz and Gabe. One final story, Alan Yorker is a psychologist. He applies for a government-funded job with a child agency, um, children's home, I guess it is, in Georgia. They, they start interviewing him, and the minute they find out he's Jewish, they cut the interview short, and they tell him, we can't hire you, you're Jewish. Amy and Alan, Liz and Gabe, they're entitled to religious freedom too. In America, government-funded discrimination against Christians, Jews, Muslims, and others should be unthinkable. This type of noxious discrimination is offensive to most Americans, and I'd hope it would be offensive to most of you here today. But RIFRA is being misused to justify this type of discrimination. And it's actually broader than this. It's being used in the most vital areas of our lives, in the context of healthcare, employment, and social services. And it's predominantly harming those of us who are already more vulnerable in our society. And I'm gonna say more about this in part three. Women are LGBTQ brothers and sisters religious and racial minorities and the non-religious. This wasn't supposed to happen. When Employment Division v. Smith came down, Americans United was part of that beautiful coalition that agreed that the court didn't get it right. We set aside our differences and we advocated for the government to take additional steps to protect religious freedom and particularly for religious minorities who don't tend to have the political power to pass religious exemptions into law. This all too rare today, kumbaya moment, produced RIFRA, right? And the congressional record shows that members of Congress who were advocating for RIFRA, they were concerned about what about the Jewish boy who goes to public school who wants to be able to wear his yarmulke but the school has a no hat rule. What's his recourse? Or what about veterans? This was also in the record. What about veterans who are denied the right to be buried you know, on the weekend, but that's what their religious beliefs mandate? But what you didn't hear anyone arguing was that RIFRA was necessary so that taxpayer-funded foster care agencies could turn away Catholic and Jewish qualified parents, or that businesses, including government-funded contractors, could ignore employment discrimination laws, or that corporations could refuse to provide health care benefits that their employees are legally entitled to. And if that had been clear at the time that RIFRA was debated, right, if it, if it had been clear that it was going to be used in all those ways, and it has been used in all those ways, RIFRA would have never passed. The difference between how RIFRA was intended to be used and how it's being used boils down to harm to others. 
This quickly splintered the RIFRA coalition and it actually happened, we can talk about that if we want more in our conversation, it happened pretty quickly. And it continues to divide us today. But even in divided times, religious freedom should unite us. It should be common ground. So where does our agreement break down? So we've all talked about this, you know, this principle. We've all talked about limitations, right? Religious freedom, like other freedoms, has its limits. Um, you know, I, I was going to use the your right to swing your fist ends at the tip of my nose. Um, and yes, Thomas Jefferson in the Supreme Court has used many times the human sacrifice um, explanation, and you know that has the advantage of being obvious. I was going to choose property rights instead. So if people ring your doorbell and they want to proselytize to you and you don't want to hear it and you tell them to go away, right? They don't have a religious right to stand there, right? No matter how sincere their religious beliefs. Or if someone goes and sets up a church in your backyard because his God told him that your backyard is holy land, right? He doesn't have the right to do that. Their religious freedom is limited by your property rights. And I'm guessing that most of us still agree. So I'm going to state this very honestly. Where our common ground seems to break down is when primarily conservative Christians, a little bit of a scary thing to say as a Jewish person, by the way. We don't like, <laughs> we don't like saying that. Is when primarily conservative Christians use religious freedom arguments to violate the rights of people who already have less power and less security in our society, to violate the rights of people that our laws are designed to give equal protection to. Many women are finally guaranteed insurance coverage for birth control, which 90% of us, more than 90% of us, use during our reproductive lives, and RIFRA takes that away. LGBTQ people are finally understood to be included in our civil rights laws, employment, non-discrimination protections, and RIFRA takes that away. And religious minorities and the non-religious are supposed to have been protected from the get-go in America, but RIFRA now favors conservative Christians at their expense, as my stories illustrate. Unfortunately, attempts to use religious freedom to undermine civil rights gains for minorities are nothing new in this country. I'm not going to say anything that I don't think we all agree with here. So in 1964, the Landmark Civil Rights Act passes, right? And it promises, it mandates for black people that they have a right to equal enjoyment of goods and services and public accommodations. It's about time, right? But then, just a few years later, a self-identified devout Baptist who's a barbecue restaurant owner challenges the Civil Rights Act, arguing that, quote, serving members of the Negro race would violate his sacred religious beliefs. In 1968, the Supreme Court flatly rejected that religious freedom claim as patently frivolous. Those were their words. And I think that we'd all agree with that decision. But I wish that we could agree that religious freedom should not be used to harm any of us. In 1790, George Washington wrote a now famous letter to the Touro Synagogue in Newport, Rhode Island. He was actually on a tour um, shoring up support for his new national government, trying to unify the nation, trying to sell what would be the Bill of Rights, including the First Amendment. So he visits the synagogue, and then later he pens a letter. And the letter that he pens is about religious liberty. Washington wrote, quote, Happily, the government of the United States gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance. That should tell us all we need to know about the extent of religious freedom. It must not be used to harm others. Whether it's anti-Semitism at our founding, <coughs> racism at a barbecue 60 years ago, or discrimination against Amy Madonna, 
or our LGBTQ family members and friends today. George Washington showed us the way. Religious freedom must not be used to harm others. And thanks for including me in this conversation. Thank you, Rachel. Well, we're certainly happy you're here to, I think, perfectly tee up um, what, we're asked, what we were asked to talk about today, which was RIFRA's modern pressure points, right, 30 years after its passage. I think you've identified precisely one of the biggest, maybe the biggest, of RIFRA's modern pressure points, which is the, this concern about third-party harm, right, which I believe is starting to appear in, in litigation. Um, I know there have been some lower court cases that have addressed this more or less directly behind maybe some of the legislative activity, the legislative conversation surrounding RIFRA. Does RIFRA need to be repealed, revised, um, to directly take into account concerns about third-party harm? So let's spend some time maybe talking about that. And Paul or Mark, from your litigation perspective, does one of you want to start? I mean, I'm, I'm happy to try to start. I mean, you know, I'll say a couple of things. First of all, just to kind of contextualize my remarks, I mean, you know, I'm even as a dutiful Scalia clerk, I'm not here to defend, you know, Smith is correctly decided, and I've, you know, filed briefs asking the court to overrule Smith. So um, don't, don't, don't mistake me as, as defending Smith uh, lock, stock, and barrel. But I, I will say, I think it is always a mistake to, I mean, it's one thing to think that, you know, Justice Scalia got this wrong. I mean, even Homer nodded. So, um, you know, like, you know, we all have bad days. But to think that he didn't even have a point um, I think is a mistake. And I guess, you know, to the extent I may be part company with, with some other folks on the panel, it's in suggesting that, like, you know, th you know a, a commitment to religious freedom in contexts where you are giving people exceptions to generally applicable laws is, I think it's the right thing to do, but I think it's a mistake to think that it's easy. And I think it's a mistake to think that, you know, you know, the only hard cases, you know, like, you know, are, are, are human sacrifice or stuff. I mean, there are hard cases, and, mm -hmm. and compelling interest, least restrictive alternative test is a very demanding test. I mean, especially least restrictive alternatives. If you take that seriously, that's, you know, incredibly protective of religious exercise. Now, personally, I'm on board that. I think that's a good thing, because I think that, you know, religious liberty is about as important a value as we have in this country. But I think if you're, it's just a mistake to sort of think that, you know, there are no hard cases uh, in the wake of RIFRA, because I think there are some legitimately hard cases. And the third party harm cases, you know, are, are, are one category of cases where they are more difficult. I mean, you know, if you are um, engaged in a religious practice that has no impact on third parties, and, you know, and the government wants you to stop, I mean, the government's just being mean. And that's like a pretty easy case to win under, you know, frankly, almost any test. That just seems crazy. But most laws of general applicability at some point are designed to prevent harms to third parties or at least perceived harms to third parties. And so, you know, I think, you know, my own view is that it is, it would be way too simplistic to say, well, there's going to be a third party harm exception to RIFRA because if you did that, you'd come pretty close to gutting it. I'll just say two other observations based on my own sort of experience. One is, I think it's actually kind of interesting that a unanimous court last term essentially didn't completely reject the notion of third party harms in the Title VII religious accommodation case, uh, Groff, mm -hmm. but certainly like put that in the back seat as opposed to the front seat and devalued that as a concern. So I think that's a unanimous court basically saying we can't use this third party harm notion to dilute religious liberty because it really is going to dilute a evident statutory conviction that we should have religious liberty protected in that case in Title VII. I think the same thing is true in RIFRA. The second thing I would say is, you know, Part of the reason we have third party harms in some of these cases is that the government is doing some things that are very unusual, like making religious employers responsible for providing the health care for all of their employees. And so, you know, in some, in some respects, the very fact that the religious adherent is in a position to inflict third party harms is itself 
a reflection of a government that's imposing things that it probably, if, if it's really a compelling interest, then the government should probably take care of itself instead of leaving it to employers. And so, you know, I, I do think that's another reason why in these third party harm cases, sometimes that's just a signal that maybe there is a least restrictive alternative. And that was certainly the answer, I think, in Hobby Lobby and uh, in the Little Sisters, which is, there's a pretty obvious, you know, if this is really a compelling interest for the government, why doesn't the government just provide this directly instead of forcing the nuns to provide it essentially for the government? Mm -hmm. Mark or Bill, do you want to add anything? You look like you might have something to say. <coughs> I, I don't have a statement to make, but I do, I do have a question. Sure. Or, or yep. two. Uh, in this case, in, in this case uh, for Rachel, this is not a gotcha question, it's a genuine curiosity question. <clears throat> you emphasized once or maybe more than once that the adoption service, or one of them, was quote unquote government funded or received government dollars. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Suppose there were no government nexus. Suppose that this was simply a, you know, a church-funded adoption agency uh, that saw this as part of its mission to facilitate mm -hmm. adoptions for people who would bring up uh, an adopted child in accordance with the tenets of the faith that they, the founders of the organization, espoused. Mm -hmm. Would the absence of the government nexus make a difference in your analysis? Very much so. Very much so. That's, that's actually a softball, Bill. Well. A softball. Because with government funds, strings are attached, right? You get benefits, and really our government is responsible for advancing the religious freedom of everyone, right? So when government funds are funding this turning away of Catholics and Jews, right, then frankly I think it should be a compelling interest to think about the government protecting religious freedom for all. Um, but in any case, when it's not the government doing that, then sure, you okay, know, we're in a whole different realm. That's, uh -huh. you know, that, that's a crucial distinction. I would go farther saying that, you know, there are, there are reasons totally outside the orbit and ambit of RIFRA that ought to be sufficient to block the government use, the use of public funds to benefit a group of religious people and not another. I mean, I mean, I can, I can think of a bunch of constitutional doctrines, and I'm not even a lawyer, let alone a constitutional lawyer, that ought to be enough to stop that, don't you think? Yeah, can, yeah I was just going to respond to that, and then Mark, I know you want to get yeah. in on this. Um, I, I think it's really important to pause here on third-party harm just for a moment, All because, right. um, you know, and I, and I understand, I mean, Groff was... It wasn't featured, you know, it was in a dissent and it wasn't really talked about. But I want to talk about the heart of, of why, what that's about and, and why third party harm has been in many, many times, including in Hobby Lobby, really read into the establishment clause of our constitution, right? And the idea is that, you know, the free exercise clause and the establishment clause need each other to protect religious freedom for all, right? So. If I'm someone who says, and I, and I heard you, Paul, you know, you said it would, you know, I, I forget your words, but, you know, you would sort of gut RIFRA if, you know, third party harm were, were a limitation on it, you know, which is what we're suggesting is the solution. We don't want to, we don't, we're not saying repeal RIFRA, you know, we're, we're saying let's, let's take away the third party harm. But if, if I'm saying that I need the government to, to uh, not harm me, Right, but my, I'm claiming that I'm being harmed by not being able to harm other people, right? Then what I'm asking for is really religious privilege. It's not religious freedom. It's unbridled free exercise of my religion getting priority and favor from the government where someone else has to bear the costs of my religion. Right, so that's why third party harm has been read into the Establishment Clause. The Establishment Clause was recognized in the plain text of RIFRA, right? And that's why it's really important that we keep in mind how important it is. Thank you. All right, Mark, the floor is yeah. yours. And I'll ask if you happen to be familiar with the South Carolina or Knoxville case Rachel mentioned, <coughs> feel free to speak to those two. Yeah, so 
first, Bill, to your question about does the government involvement uh, make it matter and the idea that that's a softball. I, th I think it is a softball, but I think it's a softball in the other direction, which is the Supreme Court got it in Fulton and nine justices, not just the quote unquote conservative Christians, but people like Sonia Sotomayor and Elena Kagan, all agreed that even though the foster agency received government funds, um, it had a free exercise right to not violate its religion as it was doing its work. Um, I think it's important to think about why, right? Why, why would they come out with that ruling? Why was it a nine nothing case? Um, and I think the answer is uh, you can imagine a world where the government is preferentially saying, I want to just fund one religious group's foster care operation. And the, uh, the legislature passes a law that says, we will just fund you and we will not fund anybody else. Uh, but that's actually not a very good description of the world we currently live in. Um, the world we live in with foster care, just like the world we live in with colleges, the world we live in with vouchers, the world we live in with hospitals. Um, is that government funds are all over the place. And the court has said repeatedly, and I think correctly, that the government can't say the religious people can't participate. Um, and you know, the facts on the ground of a case like Fulton were that there was actually never, never, like there was actually never a gay couple that came knocking on the door of the Catholic Church in Philadelphia and said, will you come and evaluate my family life? Um, like, the truth is, regular people in the real world knew. Like, we disagree, right? The gays in the Catholic Church have a disagreement about issues, some issues related to sex and marriage. And there were 30 other agencies in Philadelphia, and the Catholics were perfectly willing to say, here's the list of all the rest of them, um, and it was fine. Um, and I think that's actually a good way to live with diversity, is to say that we actually don't need to invoke the law to crush the other side or to say, you can't participate, you can't find foster homes unless you do it uh, a particular way. Um, I'll point out in all of the cases that uh, Rachel mentioned, they're not actually RIFRA cases. They're not cases where the claim asserted by the agency was RIFRA and a court said under RIFRA you can do X. Although again, the Supreme Court, including the left side of the Supreme Court, said under the free exercise um, that you do have a right to participate. Um, those are cases that uh, were decided as non-establishment clause or non-equal protection violations, and they were essentially saying the government's allowed to partner with a range of people, including religious agencies that have some limitations in how they work. But the important thing is that you've got to stretch a long way, a long way, and there's a reason some of these cases weren't appealed, how far you had to stretch. You have to stretch a long way to say that that's a third-party harm being imposed because of the free exercise of religion. Um, you can foster in Philadelphia through lots of other agencies. It's fine. If the government of South Carolina said, we will let Christians foster but not Jews, I would be delighted to sue them. Uh, but that's not the position in South Carolina. That's not the facts on the ground. And so ultimately, you can reach and try and say, well, in Hobby Lobby, you're taking away people's access to drugs. But the fact of the matter is you're not because they have other access to drugs because the Affordable Care Act created this entire system where you can get your health care not through your employer. Why would you need to get it through the unwilling nuns if the government gives it to you right there? So I would just say in the third party harm claim, most of the time, the answer is the government could do it itself or you've really got to be reaching to attribute the harm to religious liberty. Um, and in fact, um, Gays can still foster in Philadelphia, and Hobby Lobby employees who want access to whatever drugs can get them, and so too can the people who work for the Little Sisters of the Poor, and it works out just fine. All right, Bill, I'm gonna circle back to you, and I'll also ask you if you'd like, um, after you kind of weigh in on all of this, if you wanted to identify any other pressure points, so to speak, that might have caused the breakdown of that coalition you described um, in the Clinton era, feel free to put some of that on the table as well. Well, the reason I really haven't done that is that, unlike some of the other people on the panel, you know, RIFRA is about a hundred, you know, one of a hundred things that I think about and have dealt with. I'm not, yep. I'm not an expert in the contemporary application, which is why I'm listening with interest to, mm -hmm. to this, mm -hmm. to this debate. But let me let me put the following hypothetical on the table. Uh, an African-American couple stops at a diner to get lunch. 
Uh, the owner says, I don't serve African Americans, but there's a place right across the street that does. What's the harm, you may ask? Okay, but I think we all, we all recognize that the you can get it from a place across the street is not a good argument. So my question to you is, what's the difference? Yes, <clears throat> so I think the difference is the court has always treated the eradication of racial discrimination as a fundamentally different thing in American life, and that that is something the court recognized in Bob Jones and other cases. The court has just a heightened interest in stopping. Um, so I, I think that's ultimately the answer, is that the, the court views race differently in a way that even the left of the court doesn't view any of the other types of situations we're talking about. I'd also point out that like those cases don't really happen. I, I take the point that some people in 1966 may have said that. Um, but you, you know, like we, we often see the specter of the terrible race case. What if, what if the, the racist baker says, I won't bake a cake for your interracial wedding? Um, I don't, I don't think those cases uh, ever happen or have happened, and I think they'd lose if they did. I, I mean, I'll just point out, because I can't resist, that, of course, you know, that was one of the examples in Justice Scalia's Parade of Horribles. And I think it does underscore that, you know, that these issues are, th they're, they're difficult. Now, I totally agree with Mark that the race hypos aren't that difficult because of our unique history, and I think everybody would recognize there's a compelling interest in that context. But, I mean, if you want to know at least part of the answer, at least in my view, as to why sort of the, the consensus has broken down, I mean, another way to contextualize RIFRA is it passed three years before the Defense of Marriage Act. And in 1996, Congress passed the Defense of Marriage Act. And I don't have President Clinton's signing statement, but President Clinton signed that into law. It wasn't quite 97 to 3, but I did. it was 85 to 14 in the Senate, which is still a level of unanimity that we rarely see uh, you know, in this millennium. And so in an era where Congress was where it was in DOMA, some of these kind of competing interests between sexual orientation, same-sex marriage, and religious liberty just weren't apparent to people. At least to 84 senators didn't think there was, you know, potential cloud on the horizon in terms of that conflict. And now, you know, that's what a lot of these cases are about. Um, and, you know, as Mark points out, in my experience, the racial cases make for great hypos, but they don't really exist in the real world. But the sexual orientation cases happen every day because we have major religions that have very distinct views on that issue and we have civil rights groups on the other side that have equally distinct groups on the other side. And so, I mean, you know, I think it would be sort of ignoring the elephant in the room if you're asking why there's been a bit of a breakdown of the coalition. I think that issue has been central to it. Um, and I do think, you know, we, we have gone um, from, you know, this grand coalition about RIFRA being the greatest thing since sliced bread to, in a lot of at least state contexts, you know, RIFRA just being, state RIFRA is just being covers for discrimination. Um, so that is, I think, you know, a major sort of transformation that has got us into a situation where RIFRA is no longer the kumbaya moment that it was uh, back in 1993. And I'll just add, it, it's just, um, firstly, poor LGBTQ people. <laughs> I mean, our society has gone through major changes to uh, sort of get up to the program and make good on our, our promise of equality as a society. So, um, but I'll also just point out that it's not just LGBTQ people. And I know, you know, the argument there is, you know, lots of religions have long standing issues with the LGBTQ issue, right? What I tried to lay out was it's women who are being harmed, it's religious minorities and the non-religious who are being harmed. All of the people actually in our society who are a little bit less powerful and a little bit more vulnerable, that's, if you do a results analysis, that's who we're seeing RIFRA used against. As I said, you know, the Trump waiver 
in the Amy Madonna case, giving South Carolina's uh, foster care agencies the right to do it, rooted in RIFRA. The RIFRA argument comes up in the Root and Ram case. It's against the Root and Rams, right? So separate was proven not to be equal a really long time ago in our society. I thought that was what you were at. You know, you, you put it in the context of race, Bill, but you were also asking about separate, and you know, not being equal, and as I heard you. And I think it's important to remember that separate isn't, isn't equal for, for anyone. All right. I'm... You look like you need to say something. No, I'm good. Okay, great. All right. Uh, so at this point, I would invite folks to start making your way to the microphones if you have questions. I'm going to just ask one final question um, while you do that. And I'll remind you as you're formulating your questions that questions should end with a question mark and should not be an opportunity to sort of expound at length on your own views. My um, last question, if anyone wants to address it quickly, we've spent quite a bit of time talking about ways in which RIFRA is arguably um, we're talking about the perspective that RIFRA is maybe over-inclusive, gives too much protection in certain circumstances. Um, does anyone think there are ways in which the current religious freedom legal regime is, is under-inclusive in the sense that there are some religious claims, organizations, people who have valid, what seem to be valid religious liberty claims but can't win under RIFRA plus free exercise? Is that a concern at all? So I'll just say, I think there are some, one, I think Smith still does some harm. So I think there are some claims that are not Smith claims, um, that, that are not RIFRA claims where Smith does harm, and uh, I think that's a problem. Um, I think sometimes there's an issue in the court of when something gets decided. Um, in other words, there are some protections for religious groups that I think ought to protect them from intrusive discovery or fights about internal church matters that really shouldn't be done in a court, and I think our law needs to uh, recognize that by allowing those defenses to be asserted at the threshold and decided at the threshold. Um, I guess those are the two I would say. Great, thanks. Anyone else? Paul? Well, I mean, just to state the obvious, yeah. there, there are all these cases that arise in the states. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and so to me, you know, the, the reason that, you know, Smith either should be overruled or actually was overruled in Fulton, then we won't be told about it for another 10 years, as in Lemon. Um, but, but, but the reason to overrule Smith is really for the states, I think, as opposed to provide additional protection against uh, the, the government. The other thing I just can't help but sort of say in this context is, you know, one of the things that, you know, the, and, I mean, not to disagree with Mark on this, but, you know, the, the downside of the vast administrative state, let me just put it that way, um, is I do think that it's very hard for the agencies to deal with RIFRA in a way that's sufficiently responsive to what Congress was on about. Because, you know, it's, it's, when it gets to the courts, the courts, you know, can, can ap apply compelling interest, least restrictive alternatives, they're sort of used to that. But if you ask sort of a line level regulator um, in, you know, the HHS, um, you know, or the tax department to kind of promulgate a regulation in a way that avoids RIFRA problems, you know, you're really asking somebody quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, and I will just say, you know, I think part of the reason why we were successful in the Hobby Lobby and the RIFRA litigate, in the, in, the, in the Little Sisters litigation, eventually, though we took some losses on the way, but some of the lines that were being drawn in the regulations just objectively didn't make any sense. The administration knew that it was running up against religious rights, and then it accommodated religious rights, but in ways that like, you know, made like the Philadelphia Archdiocese exempt, but not the Pittsburgh Archdiocese and the like. And, you know, if, again, if you ask people who have, you know, whatever administrative expertise they have sure isn't in RIFRA, to draw some of these lines, I think they're in a very difficult position. So it's a way in saying, like, you know, I, I don't know if that's a way in which RIFRA is mm -hmm. underprotective, but it does show kind of the imperfection of sort of having this responsibility in some cases be directed to people who know a lot about a particular social policy or statute, but not a lot about RIFRA. Thank you. All right, folks, we have about 15 minutes left, and I hope we can get through several questions. Um, so we'll start with Matt. Nice to see you, Matt. Go Thank ahead. you, Matt Bowman with Alliance Defending Freedom. RIFRA says that government that can't burden religion includes a branch of the United States 
which would seem to include the legislative branch. So the pressure point I'd like to ask the panel to talk about is private rights of action. If Congress passes a law that says someone can sue you for discrimination under Title VII or Title IX, and RIFRA says that applies to a branch, you can use it as a defense. We've got some courts saying mm -hmm. you can't invoke RIFRA in that context. How do you think that's uh, going to proceed in the courts? That's a great question. I'm happy to go first. Um, I actually think it's quite clear from the text of RIFRA that RIFRA would also apply to the government giving someone a private right of action. If you imagine the Hobby Lobby case, instead of it being Hobby Lobby v. HHS or v. v. Burwell, um, instead it's employee v. Hobby Lobby. An employee says, wait, the federal government just handed me this right, and now I wish to wield this right against you. I still think Hobby Lobby would have a very strong claim that that's the government imposing a substantial burden on their religion. Um, and unless there's a compelling interest, you can't do it. I, I would also point out that the majority in the Bostock decision seemed to suggest that that was true too. The majority in the Bostock decision, when it expanded the understanding of Title VII to include sexual orientation and gender identity, said, don't worry about the religion stuff, right? And this is the majority which included the left of the court. Don't worry about the religion stuff. Among other things, RIFRA is a super statute. That would have been a bizarre thing to say if RIFRA had no applicability in the private context. So I think it does, I agree with you, it still needs to be sorted out, but it would be weird if you could say the government could give a right to some private party to wield against you, and you don't have any, when that gets wielded against you in court, you can't raise these types of defenses. It reminds me a little bit of like Snyder versus Phelps and other places, or New York Times versus Sullivan. We have no difficulty in those cases brought by private parties um, in saying, but your constitutional rights still apply if we're gonna use government created action against you, and I think the same should apply here. This side, go ahead. Hi, David Wagner, Free Families Foundation. The court, yeah, the Smith court talked a lot about courting anarchy, and it's only fair to quote that back at them, but it's always seemed to me that the real problem was not courting anarchy, but courting tyranny in this sense. Government wants to do a lot of stuff, and the more stuff government wants to do, the more, this, the more pressure is brought to bear on, well, it wasn't Riffer then, it was the uh, Sherbert v. Werner doctrine, but, what we saw in at least the decade leading up to Smith <clears throat> was an expansion of the range of state interest, government interests deemed to be compelling. And that seems to me to be a great danger to the freedom of everybody, groups and individuals, from trying to administer um, uh, a CSI test. CSIs tend to grow. Uh, I'm oversimplifying, I know, but in the early gender discrimination case, read, we read, administrative convenience was not even considered a, a rational basis. Whereas in cases like uh, U.S. v. Lee especially, Brian mentioned Ling as well, administrative convenience was a compelling state interest. Mm -hmm. And what I've always liked about Smith is that it puts a stop to this expansion of compelling state interests. And I'd like to know what anybody on the panel I guess especially Paul, uh, uh, would like to reflect on that. Well, no, I, and, I, and I appreciate sort of somebody else kind of rising to the challenge of what Justice Scalia was trying to deal with and what he was confronting there. Um, and I do think these questions are difficult. I mean, I guess, you know, in a sense, uh, I'll shift the framework a little bit by saying, um, you know, the, in, in some ways I think that kind of is related to the question of, all right, um, you know, we can all, or at least me and Mark, um, can agree that Smith should be overruled, but then the next question is what do you replace it with? Mm -hmm. And you know, some people would say, let's just go back to sort of you know, Sherbert and Yoder. And here too, I think you know, maybe it's worth kind of taking Justice Scalia seriously, even if you don't follow him exactly where he went. And you know, my, my own thought on this is that you know, the hard cases and I don't know that you have to run through compelling interest, least restrictive alternative. It's really there are some government policies that by their nature just don't admit of exceptions. They're just, you know, the tax code is a classic example. I mean, you know, you just can't really run a tax system and this is, you know, explains a decision like Lee. You can't really have a tax system with people being able to opt out because nobody wants to pay taxes. And so in those kind of contexts, you know, you maybe acknowledge that the, 
that, 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 that there isn't a basis for an exemption, you wouldn't necessarily have to run it through the compelling interest least restrictive alternatives test. I think one advantage of that, because again, I take Justice Scalia seriously, that if you're thinking about what replaces Smith, you have to think hard about what's an appropriate and manageable judicial role. And, and I, to me, you know, the focus really ought to be on this question of, you know, is this the kind of government program that's amenable to exceptions? And if it is, then of course you have to give exemptions on a religious basis, and that the free exercise clause compels that. And, you know, I always thought that Hobby Lobby and, Rifra, and, and the Little Sisters were incredibly straightforward cases because of the grandfather clause for the, 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 the women's health mandate uh, that the administration had come up with. Because not only did they give an exemption for certain oddly defined religious groups, but they basically said any secular employer who didn't give a fig about religion could keep their health care plan as long as they didn't change the details of it. And it seems to me that if the government's admitted that their interest is so amenable to exceptions, so uncompelling, if you will, uh, that they could have a grandfather clause, then of course you got to give room for religious exercise. I would, yes, go you ahead. Know, I would, I would just add, uh, and I came, <clears throat> I came to this issue as a political theorist, not a constitutional <laughs> lawyer. Uh, but I never, I never saw the problem with Yoder. <laughs> and maybe I didn't see a problem with Yoder because in my view, and I realize this has uh, institutional implications for the role of the judiciary, these cases are highly fact specific. And the idea that there's going to be a general rule that disposes of them, I think is, I know that's what, if I understand it correctly, Justice Scalia was always looking for, uh, but I'm not sure that that was the right search, frankly. Uh, and in the same way that I think a lot of moral judgments are highly particularistic and fact-specific, I could imagine a set of facts in a Yoderish case that would lead me to think that the judgment ought to come out in the other direction. Uh, so I, 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 really, I really wonder here what we're talking about. Yeah, and, and I'll just say, you know, Yoder, I mean, it's worth rereading Yoder because it is one of the least satisfying decisions that Chief Justice Berger wrote, and that's saying something. And <laughs> I mean, you know, most of the, you know, analysis really is just an ode to the Amish way of life, um, which, you know, really, you know, like, I mean, look, I, of course the Amish get that exemption. That's the sensible thing to do. But explaining why they have a constitutional right to it is a more challenging thing. And, you know, I don't, you know, whatever the political theory is, as a matter of jurisprudence, I don't think the Yoder opinion was up to the task of really explaining why it is that there was the right in that particular case. Yeah, well, someone I studied with as an undergraduate, Walter Burns, wrote an article off the Yoder decision called, if I remember correctly, The Importance of Being Amish. <laughs> <laughs> it was not an approving article. <laughs> All right, go ahead over there. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Jason Milch, and I'm a senior at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, writing my thesis on the Free Exercise Clause and on Smith. Uh, the way that I think I and most people understand it is that the only obstacle to a five-justice majority to overrule Smith are the concerns that Justice Barrett raised in her concurrence in Fulton. The solution that I am tinkering with would be to graft the historical analog test that the court basically came up with in Bruin, a case which Mr. Clement is, of course, very familiar with, uh, and to basically have the free exercise test be such that if the government could demonstrate a historical analog that supports the burden that they're trying to uh, sustain, then they would only be subject to neutral and general applicability review, and only if they cannot establish the a historical analog for the burden, would they have to justify the burden uh, via strict scrutiny? I'm curious whether the panel thinks that that is a potential solution to get Justice Barrett on board and Justice Kavanaugh as well uh, on board with overruling Smith. Glad you could make it here, and thanks for the great question about a really interesting uh, senior thesis. Does anyone want to take that? Yeah, I'll just point you to uh, Stephanie Barclay's research out at Notre Dame, if you haven't looked at it yet. She's been looking at um, a lot of the history, and I believe she's been pointed to things that she thinks in the historical record actually 
look a little bit like the means ends balancing test of compelling interest in something like least restrictive means. It's never going to be a, an exact uh, carbon copy. Uh, but she's unearthed some interesting history that um, I think could inform an approach like that. And look, I think Bruin is an interesting case with an interesting approach. I'm not sure if the court is ready to take that and sort of tear down doing tiers of scrutiny the way they've done them in a lot of the rest of the First Amendment or not. I think that feels like a, a large jump. Um, but I think as we think about what ought to replace Smith, uh, all these things ought to be on the table. Um, and ultimately, I think the bottom line is it's clear Smith is not the right constitutional answer. It's just a question of coming up with what, what should replace it. Anyone else on that? Um, Valerie Maloney. Um, I worked in the last administration on religious rights, um, and I'm not a brilliant jurist, I, a legal theorist, but I'm very interested in the practical applications. We worked very hard to look after religious freedom. And the, um, the maxim that bad cases make hard law is never truer than in the area of religion. Um, what I would like to ask within the, just in the, since, since the last administration, it seems that the religious rights have gone downhill in that we clo they closed down all the churches. How can you do that? How can you do that in a country which, which uh, prides itself on the first freedom? Um, my question, I, it, well, finally, it was none of the big churches who, who opened the churches, again, a little Pentecostal church in California on the Mexican border was the, cape, was the church which turned, which opened the doors again, even though, as you point out, the blackjack tables were running. Um, my question, and as Ellen would say, I do have one, is can we apply religious freedom questions to Harvard's anti-Semitism and ask them how can they continue to take government money when they clearly discriminate? What a note to end on. Anybody want to take that? Yeah. Bill, are you raising your hand? Uh, right. No. No. Okay. I may come in after somebody else does. Can I do 30 seconds start. on COVID? Do it. Um, look, I think COVID you know, did things that none of us thought uh, we'd ever let our government do, like shut down all the churches and keep them shut down while blackjack and you know, big box stores and all the other things that you know, weren't all that essential were treated as essential. Um, I will point out that it, it ultimately was actually some, some big religious groups that, that ultimately turned the tide. It was Agudath Israel at the Supreme Court and the Diocese of Brooklyn at the Supreme Court uh, on Thanksgiving Eve that ultimately got the court to get it right. Uh, but you're right that the first ones to say we're going to fight about this were the smaller churches, so that's true. Um, look, I, I suspect a lot of people learned a lot about how to protect their rights during COVID and what they should sit for and what, uh, what they shouldn't tolerate. And I think it made a lot more sense in March 2020 than it did in the summer of 2020. I think the court was a little bit slow to come to that conclusion, but they eventually did by November of 2020, and they, they got the rest of those opening cases right through that winter. So a little bit slow, but they got to the right place. By which time we changed the Supreme Court. That, that's what made the difference. And, and, and I'll just add, you know, uh, you know, since my religious liberty is protected, I will say thank God for blackjack tables. Because I, I, I think <laughs> it, it points out, though, it, it's a serious point, which is, you know, the cases are actually hard when there are no exceptions. So if it really was like an Ebola outbreak and it was two weeks and you couldn't go to church for two weeks and there were no exceptions, that's a hard hypo. If it's, you know, six weeks or six months and you can go to the blackjack tables, it's no longer a hard hypo. And that's why I do think that kind of this, this idea of asking, all right, you know, it's a general law and you could say it's neutral, but is it the kind of law that just only works if it is not amenable to exceptions. It seems to me that's a, a useful way of thinking about these issues. And the black tack, jack tables being open just gives away the, the, the whole game from the government's perspective. Well, uh, let me say that I think I agree with that framework. Uh, but I would, you know, I would say that a national health emergency uh, counts as a compelling state interest interest. Uh, and under, under those circumstances, for the duration of the acute threat, 
uh, that there is a justification for doing things that would be entirely unjustified under less than emergency circumstances. Having said that, I absolutely agree that if you take the public health emergency as the basic premise for policy and then start granting exemptions from it that make no sense either from a policy standpoint or a constitutional standpoint, then you've undermined your case. So, you know, you have to be consistent if you're trying to run a government, you know, with the premises of your own argument. So, Bill, you had me until you said make no sense. And I would just ask who we're going to trust to make decisions about our public health. Public health officials who have backgrounds in public health and expertise or courts. And I would choose the public health officials and say that where we do have these national emergencies, this is where I think we were together, Bill, that in those cases that are clear, yeah. religious freedom is certainly not the right to risk people's lives. Well, I think it's, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that, Rachel, because uh, not too long ago, Francis X. Collins gave an interview in which he acknowledged that the framework that public health officials brought to it was that everything other than saving lives would be given a moral weight of zero in the public health calculus. And I don't think, I don't think that's an adequate way of thinking about the problem, even in national emergencies. Now that we have started down the COVID road, we could probably talk for yeah. another hour, but, yeah. uh, but it's after two o'clock, so I think we are adjourned. Do our hosts need to say a final word? All right, thank you all for coming. Let's thank our panel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I want to do the Harvard discussion. Yeah. Yeah.